The Comedy of Errors of Beautiful Stories from Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beautiful Stories from Shakespeare by Edith Nesbitt. The Comedy of Errors. Aegeon was a merchant of Syracuse, which is a seaport in Sicily. His wife was Amelia, and they were very happy, until Aegeon's manager died, and he was obliged to go by himself to a place called Epidemnum on the Adriatic. As soon as she could, Amelia followed him, and after they had been together some time, two baby boys were born to them. The babies were exactly alike, even when they were dressed differently, they looked the same. At the same inn, where these children were born, and on the same day, two baby boys were born to a much poorer couple than Amelia and Aegeon. So poor, indeed, were the parents of these twins, that they sold them to the parents of the other twins. Amelia was eager to show her children to her friends in Syracuse, and in treacherous weather she and Aegeon and the four babies sailed homewards. They were still far from Syracuse when their ship sprang a leak, and the crew left it in a body by the only boat, caring little what became of their passengers. Amelia fastened one of her children to a mast and tied one of the slave children to him. Aegeon followed her example with the remaining children. Then the parents secured themselves to the same masts and hoped for safety. The ship, however, suddenly struck a rock and was split in two, and Amelia and the two children whom she had tied floated away from Aegeon and the other children. Amelia and her charges were picked up by some people of Epidemnum, but some fishermen of Corinth took the babies from her by force, and she returned to Epidemnum alone, and very miserable. Afterwards she settled in Ephesus, a famous town in Asia Minor. Aegeon and his charges were also saved, and more fortunate than Amelia, he was able to return to Syracuse and keep them till they were eighteen. His own child he called Antiphilus, and the slave child he called Dromio, and, strangely enough, these were the names given to the children who floated away from him. At the age of eighteen the son who was with Aegeon grew restless with a desire to find his brother. Aegeon let him depart with his servant, and the young men are henceforth known as Antiphilus of Syracuse and Dromio of Syracuse. Let alone, Aegeon found his home too dreary to dwell in, and travelled for five years. He did not, during his absence, learn all the news of Syracuse, or he would never have gone to Ephesus. As it was, his melancholy wandering ceased in that town, where he was arrested almost as soon as he arrived. He then found that the Duke of Syracuse had been acting in so tyrannical a manner to Ephesians unlucky enough to fall into his hands, that the government of Ephesus had angrily passed a law which punished by death or a fine of a thousand pounds any Syracusan who should come to Ephesus. Aegeon was brought before Solinus, Duke of Ephesus, who told him that he must die or pay a thousand pounds before the end of the day. You will think there was fate in this when I tell you that the children who were kidnapped by the fishermen of Corinth were now citizens of Ephesus, whither they had been brought by Duke Menaphon and uncle of Duke Solinus. They will henceforth be called Antiphilus of Ephesus and Dromio of Ephesus. Moreover, on the very day when Aegeon was arrested, Antiphilus of Syracuse landed in Ephesus, and pretended that he came from Epidemnum in order to avoid a penalty. He handed his money to his servant, Dromio of Syracuse, and bade him take it to the Centaur Inn, and remain there till he came. In less than ten minutes he was met on the mart by Dromio of Ephesus, his brother's slave, and immediately mistook him for his own Dromio. "'Why are you back so soon? Where did you leave the money?' asked Antiphilus of Syracuse. "'This Dromio knew of no money except sixpence, which he had received on the previous Wednesday, 
and give in to the saddler, but he did know that his mistress was annoyed because his master was not in to dinner, and he asked Antipholus of Syracuse to go to a house called the Phoenix without delay. His speech angered the hearer, who would have beaten him if he had not fled. Antipholus of Syracuse then went to the centaur, found that his gold had been deposited there, and walked out of the inn. He was wandering about Ephesus when two beautiful ladies signaled to him with their hands. They were sisters, and their names were Adriana and Luciana. Adriana was the wife of his brother Antipholus of Ephesus, and she had made up her mind, from the strange account given her by Dromio, of Ephesus that her husband preferred another woman to his wife. "'Aye, you may look as if you did not know me,' she said to the man who was really her brother-in-law, "'but I can remember when no words were sweet unless I said them, no meat flavoursome unless I carved it.' "'Is it I you address?' said Antipholus of Syracuse stiffly. "'I do not know you.' "'Fie, brother,' said Luciana, you know perfectly well that she sent Romeo to you to bid you come to dinner. And Adriana said, Come, come, I have been made a fool of long enough. My truant husband shall dine with me and confess his silly pranks and be forgiven. They were determined ladies, and Antipholus of Syracuse grew weary of disputing with them, and followed them obediently to the Phoenix, where a very late midday dinner awaited them. They were at dinner when Antipholus of Ephesus and his slave Dromio demanded admittance. Maud, Bridget, Marian, Sicily, Gillian, Jin, shouted Dromio of Ephesus, who knew all his fellow servants' names by heart. From within came the reply, Fool, dray horse, coxcomb, idiot. It was Dromio of Syracuse unconsciously insulting his brother. Master and man did their best to get in, short of using a crowbar, and finally went away. But Antipholus of Ephesus felt so annoyed with his wife that he decided to give a gold chain which he had promised her to another woman. Inside the phoenix, Luciana, who believed Antipholus of Syracuse to be her sister's husband, attempted by a discourse in rhyme when alone with him to make him kinder to Adriana. In reply he told her that he was not married, but that he loved her so much that, if Luciana were a mermaid, he would gladly lie on the sea if he might feel beneath him her floating golden hair. Luciana was shocked and left him, and reported his love-making to Adriana, who said that her husband was old and ugly, and not fit to be seen or heard, though secretly she was very fond of him. Antipholus of Syracuse soon received a visitor in the shape of Angelo, the goldsmith, of whom Antipholus of Ephesus had ordered the chain which he had promised his wife and intended to give to another woman. The goldsmith handed the chain to Antipholus of Syracuse and treated his I bespoke it not as mere fun, so that the puzzled merchant took the chain as good-humouredly as he had partaken of Adriana's dinner. He offered payment, but Angelo foolishly said he would call again. The consequence was that Angelo was without money when a creditor of the sort that stands no nonsense threatened him with arrest unless he paid his debt immediately. This creditor had brought a police officer with him, and Angelo was relieved to see Antipholus of Ephesus coming out of the house, where he had been dining because he had been locked out of the phoenix. Bitter was Angelo's dismay when Antipholus denied receipt of the chain. Angelo could have sent his mother to prison if she had said that, and he gave Antipholus of Ephesus in charge. At this moment up came Dromio of Syracuse and told the wrong Antipholus that he had shipped his goods, and that a favourable wind was blowing. To the ears of Antipholus of Ephesus this talk was simple nonsense. He would gladly have beaten the slave, but contented himself with crossly telling him to hurry to Adriana, and bid her send to her arrested husband a purse of money which she would find in his desk. Though Adriana was furious with her husband, because she thought he had been making love to her sister, she did not prevent Luciana from getting the purse, and she bade Romeo of Syracuse bring home his master immediately. 
Unfortunately, before Dromio could reach the police station, he met his real master, who had never been arrested and did not understand what he meant by offering him a purse. Antiphilus of Syracuse was further surprised when a lady whom he did not know asked him for a chain that he had promised her. She was, of course, the lady with whom Antiphilus of Ephesus had dined when his brother was occupying his place at table. "'Avant, thou witch!' was the answer which, to her astonishment, she received. Meanwhile, Antiphilus of Ephesus waited vainly for the money which was to have released him. Never a good-tempered man, he was crazy with anger, when Dromio of Ephesus, who of course had not been instructed to fetch a purse, appeared with nothing more useful than a rope. He beat the slave in the street despite the remonstrance of the police officer, and his temper did not mend when Adriana, Luciana, and a doctor arrived under the impression that he was mad and must have his pulse felt. He raged so much that men came forward to bind him. But the kindness of Adriana spared him this shame. She promised to pay the sum demanded of him and asked the doctor to lead him to the phoenix. Angela's merchant creditor being paid, the two were friendly again, and might soon have been seen chatting before an abbey about the odd behaviour of Antiphilus of Ephesus. Softly, said the merchant at last, that's he, I think. It was not. It was Antiphilus of Syracuse, with his servant Dromio, and he wore Angelo's chain around his neck. The reconciled pair fairly pounced upon him to know what he meant by denying the receipt of the chain he had the impudence to wear. Antiphilus of Syracuse lost his temper and drew his sword, and at that moment Adriana and several others appeared. "'Hold!' shouted the careful wife. "'Hurt him not. He is mad. Take his sword away. Bind him, and draw me o too.' Dromio of Syracuse did not wish to be bound, and he said to his master, "'Run, master, into that abbey, quick, or we shall be robbed.' They accordingly retreated into the abbey. Adriana, Luciana, and a crowd remained outside, and the abbess came out and said, "'People, why do you gather here?' "'To fetch my poor distracted husband,' replied Adriana. Angelo and the merchant remarked that they had not known that he was mad." Adriana then told the abbess rather too much about her wifely worries, for the abbess received the idea that Adriana was a shrew, and that if her husband was distracted he had better not return to her for the present. Adriana determined, therefore, to complain to Duke Solinus, and, lo and behold, a minute afterwards the great man appeared with officers and two others. The others were Aegeon and the headsman. The thousand marks had not been found, and Aegeon's fate seemed sealed. Ere the duke could pass the abbey, Adriana knelt before him and told a woeful tale of a mad husband, rushing about stealing jewellery and drawing his sword, adding that the abbess refused to allow her to lead him home. The duke bade the abbess be summoned, and no sooner had he given the order than a servant from the phoenix ran to Adriana with the tale that his master had singed off the doctor's beard. "'Nonsense,' said Adriana. "'He is in the abbey.' "'As sure as I live, I speak the truth,' said the servant. Antiphilus of Syracuse had not come out of the abbey before his brother of Ephesus prostrated himself in front of the duke, exclaiming, "'Justice, most gracious duke, against that woman,' he pointed to Adriana. "'She has treated another man like her husband in my own house.' Even while he was speaking, Aegeon said, "'Unless I am delirious, I see my son Antiphilus.' No one noticed him, and Antiphilus of Ephesus went on to say how the doctor, whom he called a threadbare juggler, had been one of the gang who tied him to his slave Romeo, and thrust them into a vault whence he had escaped by gnawing through his bonds. The duke could not understand how the same man who spoke to him was seen to go into the abbey, and he was still wondering when Aegeon asked Antiphilus of Ephesus if he was not his son. He replied, "'I never saw my father in my life,' but so deceived was Aegeon by his likeness to the brother whom he had brought up, that he said, "'Thou art ashamed to acknowledge me in misery.' Soon, however, the abbess advanced with Antiphilus of Syracuse and Dromio of Syracuse. Then cried Adriana, "'I see two husbands, or mine eyes deceive me.' 
and Antipholus, espying his father, said, "'Thou art Achaean, or his ghost.' It was a day of surprises, for the abbess said, "'I will free that man by paying his fine, and gain my husband, whom I lost. Speak, Aegeon, for I am thy wife, Amelia.' The duke was touched. "'He is free without a fine,' he said. So Aegeon and Amelia were reunited, and Adriana and her husband reconciled, but no one was happier than Antipholus of Syracuse, who, in the duke's presence, went to Luciana and said, "'I told you I loved you. Will you be my wife?' Her answer was given by a look, and therefore is not written. The two Dromios were glad to think they would receive no more beatings." End of the Comedy of Errors